At the same time, attitudes can change. If, for example, the U.S. went through a terrible period of terrorism, people might decide to draw the line about privacy a little differently. JFK Jr. sounds Orwellian. I fund education projects. I fund population control. Hi, and welcome to part two of JFK Jr.'s George Magazine, February 1997 edition, A Survival Guide to the Future. In today's video, I'll be going over JFK Jr.'s letter from the editor, as well as his interview of Bill Gates. It's going to be good stuff. Oh say, can you see? We should all be concerned about the future because we will have to spend the rest of our lives there. Charles Franklin Kettering Listen to the speeches of any politician out there and you're almost assured of hearing at least one reference to the future. After all, we don't seem to want to elect politicians unless they offer a hopeful vision of what lies ahead. But when the future finally comes around to the present, it usually resembles nothing of what we were promised. So we blame the folks in office for fooling us. We were all at least as responsible as the politicians because we as voters set up the rules of the game that scorches us. If you play three card Monty against someone promising big wins and you lose your shirt, whom do you blame? The fellow who scammed you or do you blame yourself for being silly enough to believe you'd win? In this issue, we've tried to provide a rough picture of what you can anticipate in the years to come. In everything from sex to war, the environment to education. So you don't have to rely solely on the words of those who trade you a pair of rose-colored glasses for your vote. After all, it's the new year. The inauguration is just over and it's time for the stock-taking state of the Union message. If you're like us, you're probably tempted to look beyond the prosaic present and a frigid February and wonder for a moment, what's next? There's something gooey about much of what you read about the future because it's usually all speculation unsupported by hard facts. So in this month's survival guide, we tell you how eight critical pol political issues will evolve and which people will affect all those changes come the year 2020. There's no magic in our choice of year other than if you're approximately my age, that would be about the time when your social, social security checks will, if we keep on our current course, bounce. But we have some solutions for that unpleasant possibility too. Two of the biggest names in the investment industry, Peter Lynch and Peter G. Peterson, explain why the social security trust fund will go bust. And they offer some practical solutions that could keep it an entitlement for generations to come. Given that a bipartisan blue ribbon panel has been able to agree on any of a number of proposed solutions for keeping the fund solvent, the Peter principles are especially topical. As a general rule, beware of those who predict the future, except of course those who study it or own it. In this issue, Edward Tenner, author of a recent book about the revenge effects of technology, talks with Wendell Bell a futurist professor at Yale University. Carl Sagan looks into the cosmos to imagine a world in which he is president. And Bill Gates answers the looming question, if all politics is local, what happens when you're all connected in the global village? Finally, no explanation of the future would be complete without a recitation of the past. We are particularly proud to have in this issue a piece by historian Douglas Brinkley on the final days of the Carter presidency. As Bill Clinton begins his second term, it's worth reflecting on how similarly situated both men were coming into the White House and why their fortunes parted. Each was a popular governor of a southern state who trumpeted his separateness from the Washington political establishment. And though Clinton hints occasionally of a chilly relationship with the Washington elite, stemming from his meteoric rise from hum humble southern roots, he has forced their acceptance of him by circumstance, if not choice. Carter, we learn, was done in by the very qualities that got him elected in the first place. 
his unwillingness to play politics the Washington way, his aloofness and his rigid sense of morality. But today, it's Carter's particular character that has earned him respect as a statesman, which he never enjoyed while president. So, we hope you enjoy George's take on the future. Why not put it in a safe place somewhere and take it out in 20 years? To paraphrase a great Englishman, it may not get you what you want, but you just might find it will get you what you need. John Kennedy. Now to the Bill Gates article. John Kennedy talks to the, to the head of Microsoft about money, Murdoch, and why he's a politician's favorite photo op. Bill Gates of Mouse and Man. In the United States, great wealth is often acquired with great speed, but no one has ever amassed so much so quickly as Bill Gates, the 41-year-old co-founder, chairman, and chief executive officer of the Microsoft Corporation. With a personal fortune in excess of $20 million, Gates presides over a company whose net worth in excess of $100 billion is more than 10 times the gross domestic product of Zaire. Not only that, his name has been become synonymous with the information revolution. His achievement is all the more astonishing when you consider that the young Gates was sure enough about his vocation in 1975 to drop out of Harvard University in his sophomore year and team up with his high school friend, Paul Allen, to lay the foundations of the Microsoft Co Corporation. It's hard to believe that the calm, modest, boyish looking Gates the opposite of stereotypical swashbuckling entrepreneur of old has transformed not only the computer industry but also how millions now work and communicate with each other. In the business community, however, there are those who say that Microsoft, the epitome of the modern company, has adopted the predatory business practices of old-fashioned industrial behemoths such as General Motors or IBM. That Microsoft's share of the software market is approaching a dangerous monopoly. In 1995, Microsoft had to drop its plans to take over software producer Intuit amid accusations that the acquisition would represent a branch of antitrust legislation. Indeed, during the course of my interview, the only occasion that disturbed the placid exterior of Microsoft's chairman was when I brought up this issue. With his software programs, a ubiquitous feature of office and homes in the Western world, Gates is now hoping to alter the practice and the perception of government. In Gates' view, so long as government is prepared to embrace the information revolution, then we can all expect government to become smaller, more accessible, and infinitely more accountable. Yet there are some who believe that Gates' vision of the future a computer-driven democracy in which the individual, liberated by technology, will be self-sufficient, might easily lead to the scenarios predicted by Aldous Huxley in Brave New World, or George Orwell in 1984. Far from connecting people to each other, Gates' critics allege the computer age will herald an era of social alienation, a world where everything can be acquired or communicated via one's workstation and where there will be little need to participate in what we understand to be civic life. Worse still, it might allow government to pry more effectively into our lives. As I walk through the Microsoft campus in Redmond, Washington, just outside Seattle, the only city people move to so they can be closer to nature, as a writer once joked, I couldn't help noticing the utilitarian quality about the place. Here, Gates is known by all simply as Bill and there's a collegiate feel to the buildings. As for the people who work for Bill Gates, they walk around looking relaxed and just fine. Some earnest Microsoft employees insist on wearing shorts year-round, regardless of the temperature outside. But there's also an air of overwhelming purposefulness. You are less likely to find a tie or a suit hanging on the back of a door than a sleeping bag. For catnaps during those long Northwestern nights, programming the next generation of Microsoft software. Just how, for the appearance of the place, matched the temperament of its maker, I would only learn after I had entered Building 8 and climbed to Floor 2, where the chairman of Microsoft had his surprisingly modest office. Now for the interview portion. 
John Kennedy asks, There's a lot of speculation these days about how the internet will change our lives. I'm particularly interested in how you think it will change politics and people's interaction with government. Bill Gates, There's an opportunity to improve politics and democracy wherever you have an advance in communications technology. The internet is a tool that helps you find information in a much better way than anything else. Historically, most tools of communication were either broadcast, which meant your material had to appeal to millions and millions of people, or personal and able to address only a, f a very s small audience. But the internet provides a single individual with access to virtually unlimited information on any given topic. JFK Jr. How can that improve the political process? Bill. Well, let's say they're cutting five billion from some program in the budget. Most people don't get enough background to know whether this is a wise move or not. They don't know the key political issues, what the trade-offs are, or how this particular budget item has been spent historically. With the internet, not only can you take that news item and have it linked to background information, but you can also reach out and find other people who who are interested in that issue. The internet is scalable in the sense that if something really catches your eye, you can become as educated and involved in the subject as you want to be. JFK Jr. So, one of the things that the internet has changed is the dynamic between elected officials and their constituents. Suddenly, the folks in Washington aren't the only ones with access to all the relevant information on a given issue. Bill, clearly, Elected officials are more accountable now. For example, if there's a big vote in Congress, I can quickly find out exactly how my congressperson voted and even what he or she had to say. You cannot get that level of detailed information in a national news article. About 40% of the U.S. homes have personal computers now. 40%? That's incredible, huh? And that's rising. So, the implications of this kind of accountability are significant. JFK Jr. Constituents can also now swamp their re representatives with data as opposed to the other way around. Bill. Well, it must be pretty hard with the paper, ma paper mail nowadays because people try to bombard a congressperson's office with various opinions. Electronically, it's a lot easier. Congress people can use email as a sort of poll to see how many people were for something and how many were against it. Though I feel sorry for the person who reads the president's email because I'm often copied on the same junk email. He laughs. That sounds like Ross Perot's notion of direct democracy. Is that where we're headed? Okay. Bill, in the future, direct democracy will be feasible. An extreme example would be to say, on a weekly basis, we'll take an issue and have everybody vote on it. But personally, I think representative democracy is better. Elected representatives can be a lot more thoughtful. They have the time to listen to both sides of an issue and often come up with the non-obvious solution. In the future, we'll have to choose representative democracy, not because it's the only system available, but because we believe that it's the best approach available. JFK Jr. In your book, The Road Ahead, you describe people becoming more self-sufficient through technology. You say it will allow people to eliminate many of the tedious routines of everyday life. What are the implications for our government? How will the burgeoning electronic community change our national community? Is government being rendered obsolete? Bill, I don't think there's much that government does that you can eliminate altogether. Certainly, technology will make the government a lot more efficient. In the future, instead of filling out paper forms or standing in line and talking to somebody in a government department, people will simply go online. So the government can be smaller than it is right now, but it's not dramatic. I mean, it's not like you say, oh, this is the world of the internet. Let's get rid of VA hospitals. JFK Jr. How do you respond to the argument that the cost of this technological self-sufficiency is the loss of our traditional sense of community? If you can get everything you need through the phone or TV, you lose those kinds of human exchanges that 
keep us connected as citizens. Bill, it cuts both ways. Say that I'm from Israel and I want to listen to a radio broadcast from my homeland. Today, you go to the internet and boom, there you are. No matter where you're located, you can maintain contact with any cultural group you belong to. On the other hand, physical communities were really primary when we were all just farming together and there were no telephones or books. As you make the world a smaller place, ties to people in your proximity are paradoxically reduced. But those physical communities impose cultural standards in a stronger way than when you are free of those constraints and don't have that kind of attachment. JFK Jr. Will online communities ever replace physical communities altogether? Bill, it's nonsense to say that people are just going to sit at home and use their computers. But people shouldn't underestimate how much we're going to improve the nature of that computer experience. There will be talking 3D images of yourself that will enable you to sit and converse with people, play games with people, and a lot of neat things. We will never replace the idea of, let's go on a picnic together, or let's climb a mountain together. In fact, as technology increases our efficiency, we will have extra time to engage in leisure activities with one another. Let's take shopping as an example. Sometimes shopping is purely utilitarian. I need to get soap. So I go on the internet, type in soap, and the soap gets delivered. But sometimes shopping is an experience with a bunch of people when you want to go window shop and all that. In no way does the computer mean you are not going to make that choice. JFK Jr. Do you think that people who are disposed to experiment with technology will have a kind of distinct political orientation or identity? Bill. Well, there are a lot of people involved with technology who are very optimistic about what technology will provide. They tend to think there's got to be a way of structuring incentives so as to greatly reduce government's involvement. So you will probably find a lot more libertarians in the technology sector than anywhere else. JFK Jr. What about people on the internet? Bill. The internet has grown enough that you find people of all political stripes out there. I think the internet represents the future. That's why you had Bob Dole giving out his website address in a presidential debate. Every politician wants to be associated with the future. There's no country where I've gone where there hasn't been an interest among the top political leaders in sitting down and talking with me. Part of it is the legitimate issue of talking about how their country can exploit techno technological advances and part of it is just trying to associate themselves with technology and the bright future that comes with that. JFK Jr. What do you see as the government's role in developing the internet? Bill Clinton has drawn analogies between the information superhighway and Dwight D. Eisenhower's highway building program in the 50s. Bill, the highway analogy would suggest that the government should be deeply involved. The government built the highways, but in the case of the internet, no one is suggesting that the government needs to do anything of the kind. Whenever you have something new like this, it's best for the government to sort of sit back and see how it develops. And where there are problems, fine, the government can step in. For example, some people said, let's have the government come, come in and set standards on the internet. So all these systems that are formatted differently will work together. Thank goodness the government didn't choose to do that because the de facto standards that have evolved are working super, super well. So to date, the government's role in setting standards has been quite modest. Bill, it's always surprising how well old concepts carry over into the new medium. It's overly idealistic to act like, oh, the internet is the one place where people should be able to do whatever they wish. They do scams, libel people, steal copyrighted material. Society's values have not changed fundamentally just because it's an internet page. Take copyright. Sure, there should be some clarification about copyright, but the old principles work surprisingly well in the new medium. Anybody who says you have to start over, I don't agree with that. JFK Jr. Will it be possible to maintain our privacy in a digital world? Bill, privacy is a very interesting issue. I think people are a little naive about how 
much data exists about them electronically today. Some countries are already issuing these smart cards with all your vital information on them. You use them to claim medical benefits, to vote, to identify yourself, to the bank, and so on. JFK Jr. Sounds Orwellian. Bill. You know, the degree of privacy afforded each individual will always be a political decision. It's a decision for each society. The U.S. The U.S. is the ultimate we believe in privacy country, so the government will probably never issue smart cards. At the same time, attitudes can change. If, for example, the U.S. went through a terrible period of terrorism, people might decide to draw the line about privacy a little differently. JFK Jr. Speaking of the government, do you think that the antitrust investigations brought against Microsoft are fair? Bill. Well, the industry we are in is very important. We've been immensely successful, so at some point it was going to be worthwhile for the government to look into our industry. We don't have any issue with the way the laws are written or even with the idea that very successful companies like ours are going to be looked into. What's interesting is that in terms of power in the marketplace, none of us in the world of high technology have the kind of power that, say, Coke has in the soft drink market. In our business, not even the most successful companies like IBM or Microsoft can stand still. If we stand still, we're going to be replaced pretty quickly. Our business is less forgiving than any other that I can think of. We reached a constant decree with the Justice Department freely and fairly, and we are perfectly satisfied with what came out of that. But as long as we are successful, competitors will try to exploit the situation and try to hobble us as a competitor. It also shows in parentheses. After protracted negotiations, Microsoft signed a consent decree with the Department of Justice in July 1994 to settle charges of antitrust violations. The company agreed to monitor itself primarily to consider whether new acquisitions would lead Microsoft to further dominate the software market and to cease the acquisition if it would. JFK Jr. What about the criticism that Microsoft's dominant position in the industry is anti-competitive, that the industry should be reconfigured so that a thousand flowers can bloom instead of one big tree that dwarfs everything else. Bill, anybody who would say that doesn't understand our business. There are more new companies created in our industry than in all other industries put together. JFK Jr. Wouldn't the competition and variety be even greater to the PC industry without a dominant player like Microsoft? Bill, no. Someone had to come in and play the role that we play. That is, create the standard and really evangelize the platform. Why are there a hundred times more software companies today than before? It's because they are writing software for a standard environment that Microsoft created. Why are there so many hardware companies offering all these choices because there is a standard hardware environment that we created. JFK Jr. How do you respond to the criticism that basically Microsoft behaves toward new entries into the field the way IBM behaved when Microsoft was just getting started? Your early success was predicated on maintaining an open software environment, promoting the compatibility of your products with other products. But now that you are a market leader, some are saying you advocate a closed software architecture. Bill, the word open is just an abused word. It started out as a slogan for workstation vendors. What counts are innovative software products that work well with what people have. We and other companies created the current computer industry regime. You can buy one brand of PC on Monday, another on Tuesday, and your software still works and you get a choice. This has made computing very successful and we're the key element there. So the openness that counts is the basis on which we and everybody else compete. And because of our products, we're doing very well in that regime. JFK Jr. Rolf Waldo Emerson said that an institution is the lengthened shadow of one man. In what sense is Microsoft a reflection of you? Bill. In the sense that we love great software, 
We're very optimistic about what software can do. We're very product oriented, very much looking for the new things we can do. It's a bit of an engineering culture here, fairly fast moving. A lot of companies waste a lot of time congratulating themselves about what's going well. When I sit down and talk about a product, I just focus on the opportunities to make it better. You can save a lot of time this way. JFK Jr. Microsoft just entered into a partnership with NBC for a news channel slash website called MSNBC. You've also recently launched Slate, an online magazine. As you get deeper into the information business, will your own views color the content of the news you provide the way Rupert Murdoch has set the Fox News channel up as an antidote to the perceived liberal bias of the establishment press. Bill, I'm not interested in doing that. I'm surprised Rupert is able to retain quality people with that approach. I mean, that's very dangerous and perhaps inappropriate. He claims he's just reacting, that the rest of the press has a liberal bias. I personally don't see that. The people you hire to be editors and writers, they have their own opinions. That's their job. My job is to run a great, great software company. I'm very careful to keep my political views separate. JFK Jr., why do you keep them separate? Bill, because the alternative is inappropriate. I have my personal views. Then there's Microsoft, a company that gets involved in very few political things. My own views are those you'd expect from somebody who feels like He's been very, very lucky, and that the resources under his command are really society's resources. And I have to be clever about how I'm going to funnel those back in. I fund education projects. I fund population control. I'm very big on the United Way. JFK Jr., do you mind whether I ask if you're a Democrat, a Republican, or an Independent? Bill, well, it's a tricky issue because, as I said, I try to keep my political views separate from the companies. I went to an event where I said I was a Democrat, and that was covered publicly. When it comes to issues of how business is treated and managed, I wouldn't subscribe to a lot of Democratic views. When it comes to social issues, you'd find me very much on the Democratic side. JFK Jr. What did you think about Ted Turner's notion that extremely wealthy people like you and billionaire investor Warren Buffett would donate more of your money? If someone published a list of biggest donors similar to Forbes magazine's list of wealthiest individuals. Bill. Ted said some things that just weren't true. He said that Warren and I didn't give money away because we want to be high on the list of the wealthiest. That is just a total fabrication. Warren and I have both said that we don't believe in passing huge amounts of wealth onto our heirs and so, one way or another, my wealth will go to various causes. I think the fascination with wealth is always going to be there. It's unfortunate that it creates a simplistic view of who I am and what I care about. It's sort of an invasion of privacy. I wish the list wasn't there. But hey, what's free about the press if you can't make a list like that, you know? JFK Jr. So you're planning to give most of your money away when you die? Bill. I'm giving away 30 to 40 million a year now. And since 1992, I've donated 200 million to my foundation. So I'm already doing some things, but as a percentage of my wealth, I'll do most of it when I could put a full-time effort into that. That's the only caveat. My work now is focused on trying to keep Microsoft successful. JFK Jr. How does the immensity of your wealth affect your life? Bill, it's a very strange thing. I think it's unusual that someone can have so much money. JFK Jr. It strikes you as strange? Bill. Oh, very. Are you kidding? Somebody who has this much money has a command on society's resources. In my view, it all comes down to how you use it. JFK Jr. What do you see on the road ahead for the Microsoft Corporation? Bill. We're based on a vision of computers becoming an incredible tool for everybody. It's a vision that's very far from being realized. Computers can't listen to what you're saying, they can't speak to you, they can't see, they don't learn. I mean, computers are still pretty limited today. My entire life has been devoted to the future, and exciting new things are on the way. There is something called Moore's Law, 
which says that basically every two years computers get twice as good. That's a sure thing. So there you have it. Very interesting stuff. Thanks for joining me today. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, I hope you got a lot out of this. Be sure to come back for part three where we're going to go over Platform 2020, a survival guide to the future. And part of that will be how some lung attacking virus will be predicted for the year 2020. Pretty interesting stuff. Be sure to like, subscribe, hit the bell for, no for notifications. Talk to you soon.